Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm director of CREES and of the Copernicus program in Polish studies. I got it right this time. And today I have the pleasure to introduce Rebecca Friedman, who is associate professor of history and director of European studies and of the EU Center of Excellence at Florida International University in Miami. She obtained her PhD in history, in Russian history, at Michigan in 2000, so we are a proud supporter of her work. Uh, she's a, an alum. Um, and has since published extensively on Russian masculinities in the 19th and 20th centuries, on childhood in Russia, and on narratives of transnational belonging. She's now completing a new monograph uh, on, uh, on time entitled Time at Home, which investigates how new understandings of historical time are, are expressed in representations of domesticity at the fancy act or turn of the century Russia from 1890 to 1930. Her talk today is from that new project. Uh, it is entitled From Gentry Estates to Urban Apartments, Temporality and Domesticity at Russia's Fin Siècle. So uh, please um, join me in welcoming Rebecca. And please turn off your cell phones if you haven't already done so. And I also invite you in, I hope you took notes of the very great events um, coming up. This and that. And this is also the third talk that we have on a mini-series on uh, material culture in Russia and Eastern Europe. So we're really glad that Rebecca can present her new work uh, that offers a comparative perspective with Hungary and also Poland uh, and Germany on, on Russia, Jewish rule. Thank you so much. I guess I need to use this. It is beyond a pleasure to be here for obvious reasons, which is to say I'm not only an alum of the PhD program, but I got my bachelor's here too. So it's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you and thank you, Genevieve, for inviting me. So today I'm going to take up this theme, right, set in motion by Genevieve and Chris in this brown bag series, Material Culture and Social Change in Russia, East Europe, and Eurasia. And of course, in my discipline of history, I'm inclined to ask, what can things teach us about the past? What role does materiality play in our research, our evidence, and ultimately our production of knowledge about the present, the past, and our predictions for the future? Well, today I'm going to turn to my current project, as you heard, which is entitled Time at Home, and take a stab at some of these questions. Okay, so I'm taking up your problematic. Now, at its broadest level, my project called Time at Home reveals how domestic space embodies modern concepts of time. In particular, the book highlights how, in a period of tremendous upheaval from about 1890 to 1930, Russians embraced notions of the home that reflected new ideas about the flow of historical time. As the past collapsed in on and helped to define the present moment, predictable linear temporal notions did not sufficiently represent how modern turn-of-the-century Russians understood time, history, and memory. So then rather, on, rather than on a forward predictable path, I argue fin de siècle time was imagined as heterogeneous and fluid. This heterogeneity included somewhat contradictory impulses of temporal flow. On the one hand, they included layered time, where numerous eras appear simultaneously as a kind of pastiche. And on the other hand, modern time included notions of temporal rupture and irreversibility. So everyone understood that there was no turning back, not really. You couldn't turn the clock back, and that the past had become inherent in the present. Okay? And these notions of historical time both shaped and were manifested through space and in material objects. So why the fin de siècle, which, of course, we have to note which fin de siècle turn of the 20th, not the 21st. I make that mistake all the time, getting old. I mean the turn of the 20th century. Fin de siècle understandings of time were both changing and changed how individuals saw themselves and their place in the world, as populations across Europe and the US were undergoing processes of modernization at various speeds, including the spread of mass culture, political society, the rise of new technologies. They began to reflect on historical time itself. 
Russians began to think of themselves as part of a distinctly modern history, one that had a past and looked consciously toward the future. Modern ideas about time, especially historical time, allowed for this clash of temporalities and mixing of aesthetics and actions from a variety of eras. Contemporary historian and theorist Jose Palti makes precisely these distinctions. He emphasizes how modernity was born of a clash between two contradictory understandings of time, one objective that pushes faith, puts his faith in progress and linearity, and the other subjective that emphasizes this perpetual transformation, discontinuity, and rupture. And ultimately, Palti tells us that time irreversibility is a key aspect of modern historical <clears throat> identity. So time can rupture but not flow backwards, he says. Time periods, too, as we will see, can exist simultaneously through space and in space and objects and structures that reflect in a single moment a multiplicity of errors, eras, <laughs> um, of memories, and of moments in time. So this is, I argue, as Palti suggests, how the past emerges into and helps to define the present. The very mingling and clash of time frames and the belief that there's no turning back marked modernity and was heightened at the turn of the 20th century across Europe, the US, and as I will show now in Russia. So ideas about the home, like those about time, were too in flux at the turn of the century. The home and its domestic aesthetics contained multiple temporal narratives. The home, its meaning its everyday realities and its aspirational desires, emerged as a key site for change as the urban environment was transforming outside its doors. Not only were many people actually moving into new homes as rural life gave way to urban living, they were also influenced by a new domestic or by a series of new domestic ideologies and expectations. These domestic ideologies often migrated east from Europe and transformed when grown in Russian soil, both in bourgeois and revolutionary utopian iterations. Long imagined by scholars to be absent in Tsarist Russia, bourgeois domestic aesthetics, at least in widely read prescriptive texts and magazines, did emerge in Russia at the end of the old regime, if never perfectly parallel to domesticity in other parts of Europe. So this modern domesticity contained and reflected modern ideas about time, whether nostalgia for yesterday, efficiency for today, or dreams of a utopian tomorrow. So first things first, things. I've been waiting to say that. I got to say it. <laughs> OK. The fin de siècle domestic interior with its parlor furniture and its kitchen gadgets contained objects galore that embodied and in some cases defined modern time consciousness. In other words, changing and multi-layered <clears throat> understandings of temporality could be seen and felt in the material world, in objects, in the layout of spaces, and their representations. So let me just back up a moment. What does it mean, this is all very kind of conceptual, what does it mean to say that temporal frames are embedded in things, in objects, and in material culture? Well, I'll answer that. Objects, in other words, contain time. So objects dictate temporal meanings. Objects hold time, they fade, they're cleaned, right, to wash off the past. They're made from materials of the past, antiques and such, or maybe of the future. Objects can, objects can simultaneously reproduce as well as can mark the passage of time. Objects can also embody memory or inspire future action. Things embody or contain time and help to define temporal change. So this talk is going to look at the intersections of time, domestic space, and the material. How is time manifest in things in Russian homes at the turn of the 20th century? So what I'm going to do is take two individual case studies from my book as a way to illustrate the ways in which temporal narratives reflective of modern time consciousness can be seen through objects of domestic interiors. And in particular, I'm going to look at nostalgia and efficiency, each representative of modern time regimes. 
So the first case is nostalgia. So the gentry state, estate and its temporal representations. Now, nostalgia emerged as one particularly ubiquitous outcome of these new time regimes in the Russian context. Nostalgic images flourish among turn of the century educated Russians in their journals, magazines, and individual personal writings. In this way, the nostalgic writer painted a picture of a time and place long gone, replete with its objects and spaces of memory, whether a spoon, a garden, or a childhood room. So safely at a distance, these spaces and the objects within remind the reader both of her own time um, <clears throat> as separate and of the past as irrevocably gone. The descriptions of domestic space brought the readers beyond the present moment and provided some comfort to those in an age of dramatic transition. So for Russians living in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, the nostalgic gaze existed as post-Soviet cultural critic Svetlana Boym suggests, to quote her, somewhere in the twilight of the past or on the island of utopia where time has happily stopped as on an antique clock. Now, although those words are written by Boym amidst post-Soviet early 21st century anxieties, I would say that they mirror a phenomenon familiar to the early 20th century. Okay? Writers and readers found themselves amidst equally tumultuous transformations, including the Russian state's industrial drive and the subsequent migration to cities, the revolution of 1905, not to mention World War I. So 100 or so years prior to Boehm's reflections, in the middle of these countless political and social upheavals with the future uncertain, nostalgic writings and portraits surged. Just as the early 20th, 21st century gaze fixated on objects and materials representative of late Soviet society, toys, pins, lamps, drinkware, the early 20th century observer found himself surrounded by representations of cultural artifacts and textual musings from the 18th and 19th centuries, when life was imagined stable and predictable. At the start of the new century, as modern conceptions of temporality and history emerged, Russians glanced backwards to times and places beyond the reach of the anxieties of modern life. So the fin de siècle saw profound changes in society's time regimes, as I've suggested. One way of understanding these changing modern temporal narratives is by looking at self-writing, so autobiographical type of writing in the early um, 20th century. So the following passages that I'm going to read come from a memoir portrait of the well-known um, estate of Abramsova, and this is published in 1922, when the wealthy merchant Sava Mamontov and members of his artistic circle walked into his recently purchased Aksakov family estate, Abramseva, in the waning decades of the 19th century, they immediately realized that they were stepping into another era. Fin de siècle merchants and artists like Mamontov and his circle understood that, this is quoting the memoir, they had to show profound respect for the previous owners. Although he expanded the footprint of the house and created a new wing to accommodate his own family, he kept many objects, and his narrative describes this. He kept the tables, the dressers, the chairs, where they were, and did little to change the visual landscape. The past was, in this sense, everywhere. It was embedded in the domestic material objects, whether the furniture or, again to quote the memoir, Aksakov's old things. And it resided in, again a quote, a kind of spirit reflected in the Aksakov stories still told by the servants whom Mamantov retained. And yet, even as elements of the former era continue to thrive, quote, a new young energetic life emerged at the same time. So in this narrative, obviously, multiple temporal frames exist simultaneously and were sensed in the walls, in the objects, and in the memories of those who lived in the present, embedded as they were in the spaces and the objects of domestic life at Abramsova and in Russia as a whole. 
So these two time frames felt at the same moment reflect the multi-layered aspects of modern time regimes. At the fin de siècle, as landlords sold their estates and peasants moved to cities, there emerged this desire to recover what had been lost, right? Whether discursively, visually, or in memory itself. Writers and readers embraced nostalgic portraits of their own childhoods and of the material world and created their own notion of the past, including estates, furniture, and vases, for example. Page upon page of journals and memoirs written at the fin de siècle reified estate life at the moment when it was receding from view. So in these early 20th century pages, against the backdrop of war and revolution, the estate itself symbolized what had been lost, and it embodied this nostalgia. Nostalgia found in the pages of fin de siècle publications, even among current political and military conflict, was not so much a longing, of course, for a real past, as it was a function of the centrality of loss of an imagined past to the modern <coughs> condition. Nostalgia, with its embracing of movement, change, and rupture, reflected this modern circumstances of urbanization, mass production, political upheaval, and industrial change. So in the midst of all this transformation, many in Russian society tried against hope to embrace the past and celebrate, for example, this era of peasant handicrafts and simplicity or the calmness of a state life now gone, if it ever existed at all. As peasant workers packed their bags and moved to cities and former landlords sold their fields to move to smaller quarters, there was this renewed interest in the estate in general. This resurgence, unlike its 18th century counterpart, involved the creation of an ideal that not only was at odds with the reality of the waning gentry state, but also was a result of modern growing aesthetics, of modern aesthetics, right? One, one that launched Russia solidly into the new century. And by the late 19th century, the word, the Russian word for country, home, or estate, usadba, bears little resemblance to the realities of peasants and the majority of serf owners in the pre-emancipation era. Yet journals and memoirs uh, overflow with depictions of and a desire for an era that never was, right? It is an era that the Russian estate, it is in this era at the turn of the century when the Russian estate began to acquire a history one that reflected very much present concerns as opposed to the concerns of the pre-emancipation era. <clears throat> now this embracing of historical modern time meant that the nostalgic longings for return to the pastoral were transformed in a modern context. Perhaps the starkest reflection of this modern temporal impulse is found in the appearance, and now I get to my evidence, of the magazine Stolitsa i Usadba, or Capital City and Country House, which was published from 1913 to 1918. And it, was this, uh, it is this really interesting lifestyle magazine that recounted for readers this kind of lost beauty right, of a state life. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on this one publication alone. Although note, please, that there are many other such publications, including Stadia Gordi with its antiques, and, and there are several kind of preservationist and uh, restorationist journals and impulses uh, at this time. But this lifestyle magazine, aimed at a very much an elite audience, um, chronicled the period with its layout of elite domestic spaces, social commentary, and sleek advertisements. It had articles on individual estates, portraits of weddings, and photos of balls, as well as the occasional gussied up dog. The audience for this glossy, no, this glossy magazine, um, like I said, was essentially an elite and also the emergent middle classes. So it was aspirational as well, I would argue. Um, <clears throat> it appeared twice a month, and it had as one of its explicit missions to, quote, preserve the past. One of the ways in which Stolitsa invoked this forward, progressive, moving flow of time um, was that it, well, this is what I will argue, is that even as it sought to preserve some version of the past, it presented this genealogical histories of estates, mansions, and its inhabitants. Authors paused on the changing inhabitants and renovating of structures as estates passed from one generation to the next. 
with each new set of occupants, aspects of the built environment and the objects within its walls were transformed, whether improved or destroyed, reflecting this progressive linear movement of time through domestic space. Yet at the same moment, the narrative of occupancy and renovation or renewal of the built environment and the creation of this past included a creation of this pastiche of interior objects. The visual centerpieces of each of these journals is an elaborate portrait of the homes of the past and their parlors, their gardens, their bedrooms, and their chapels. This emphasis on estate aesthetics might come in the form of a detailed visual spread of pictures of each room and objects within it, whether vases, furniture, or commentary on the surrounding natural beauty, which allowed the residents to enjoy the so-called beautiful views and created many opportunities for enjoying nature and so forth. So together, the articles on the estate represent a world that had both vanished into the past and yet was desirous in the present amidst this uncertain future. Each issue contained a focus on one or another estate from the 18th or early 19th century. In most every issue, there's a section entitled New and Old Portraits, which recounts the shifting ownership stories intermingled with the history of the physical layout of these transformations, so the buildings and the objects over time. We learn about the interior and exterior design of a particular historical estate and the inhabitants within. The articles on estates that encompass the bulk of each issue of Salitza reflect modern temporality. On one hand, they're, as I've suggested, the evoc they're evocative of this progressive flow of time and also at the same time this layering of errors in the very moment. This layering might include a self-conscious embrace of multiple frames. Authors might mention how one must respect the past, as one author does, um, and to quote, we must respect the taste of our ancestors. At the same time, the author urges us to appreciate how the estate and its interior would embody the modern beauty of today. So the language is very mixed there. Authors are more or less self-reflective about this process of discovering the layers of the past within the walls of the estates. Just to give you one example, in one estate called Yarapolets, it's an estate that happens to be in the lands of Ukraine, the author narrates his experiences traveling to the estate over a, hundred, over a number of years. So he goes back over years um, in order to describe this estate and write this, this piece. And he falls in love with the estate. And he enumerates the objects and the buildings that he saw. He says, I fell in love with this place. It's most fascinating buildings with a colonnade and molding finishes from the outside. And it's high ceilinged rooms with its hall. It's embellished marvelous rooms, stylish chandeliers, and ancient furniture. Yet he notes, too, the ways in which it has, it has attempted to conform to styles of the day. Let me, allow me now to just pause for a moment in a more in-depth way on a single uh, estate, the estate of Mikhailovka, which appeared, this article appeared in the summer of 1916, obviously at a moment when Russia's at war. The series of pieces on this estate appear amidst war and bloodshed, and it emphasizes the weight of history and the past as the reader is taken through a room-by-room -room tour of the estate and its grounds. In Mikhailovka, we learn there appeared a gallery of portraits of those who had lived in the estate over centuries. There are art and domestic objects which betray the multiple temporalities represented here. There is, and these are all quotes, a ca candelabra from Nikolaevan times which sits near the, the stone-tiled oven in the style of Louis XVI. Down the hall in the dining room, there's a wonderful chandelier from Petrine times. And finally, in the living room, one finds remarkably comfortable, big, and somewhat unusual form of a chair, which uh, the author guesses is from a Nikolaevan factory, marking it as likely in the early part of the 19th century. And also in the living area, um, in the library, the office next to it, there are many wonderful and even rare pieces of furniture from the beginning of the last century. The article ends by emphasizing the layered and eclectic nature of objects on this estate. The author signals this multiplicity by combining 
<clears throat> excellent first-class antiquities and modern comforts, and that's a quote. And that, he says, is the motto of Mikhailovka, and I would argue could be the motto of the moment writ large. In addition to emphasizing the variety of styles contained within the estate, the articles on this estate are attentive to the passage of time embodied by the very buildings themselves, so the built environment as well becomes a character in the story. In one of the texts on Mikhailovka, readers learn that on the lands, there were two mansions, once two mansions, large and small. The large has two stories and has been preserved till this day. The other is smaller and falling apart. And so the Sovremeni, the modern large building in Mikhailovka, is pasted together, the author tells us, from many parts over many eras. And what follows is a discussion about the piecing together of the larger structure over time. The author wonders whether or not the windows, for example, all match up, um, given the varying times at which they were installed. Quote, from the side of, of the garden to the portico, there is built a vast terrace and staircase, which is obviously from a much earlier time, the author writes. The reader encounters this layering of time in the very structure and the built environment of the estate. Um, the present day also interacts with the nostalgic narrative in the many pages of advertisements at the back of each magazine. So each of these um, issues has all of the descriptions of the estates and other things. And at the back, several pages of each issue, we see all of these ads, right? Um, and it's very incongruous um, because the portraits of the past, that kind of drip of nostalgia in the drawing rooms and the estates, have one aesthetic, but the aesthetic of the magazine, of the ads themselves, is, are all in this kind of modern, sleek style that has no place in these imperial, grand, noble estates. So in this sense, the magazine exudes an aesthetic sense that appears kind of betwixt and between. The spatial arrangements that it depicts represent on the one hand now and look not at a critique of the modern city per se, but rather at how historical time was present in the city and embodied by its objects and its things. new domestic style. The middle class, likely female readers of this magazine, were meant to emulate this modern new style of interior design and architecture as a strategy for living in the now, living in the modern every day. And here's a quote from one of those issues, in this 1908 issue, rather. The whole world is moving ahead. Everything is changing. We leave behind millions of old habits and ways of doing things and usher in the new. A million ways of living are dying, and in their place rises a new generation of ideas and beliefs. living rooms, and pillows laying in sleeping quarters, all of which were described in these magazines. 
1912 piece in the upscale, well, more upscale, glossy magazine, Ladies World or Damsky Mir, offered its readership advice about how to cope with the in the early decades of the 20th century. Readers had to contend with the residue of the past while simultaneously confronting the troubles of an industrializing present. So here's a quote from that particular issue. In our times, impediments exist everywhere, from the congestion of housing and the related limited nature of space. What remains of the past, the article tells us, are carpets that provide coziness in any room. But what the reader quickly learns is that this coziness itself comes at a price too great. Dirt and waste of time. We're told that the old style chairs collect dust and elegant furniture can be difficult and time consuming to clean. So in the present, in our times, as writers frequently expressed, interior arrangements and domestic aesthetics were meant to embrace modern-day scientific standards of efficiency and cleanliness. An efficient and hygienic apartment promised the participation in the life of the modern city, both by serving as a refuge from the filth of the, of the outside world, the, the city itself, and also celebrating modern values, right, of cleanliness, health, and also saving time. Russian urbanites at the fin de siècle lived in a time of increasing attention to mechanical time, to uniformity, and to science. They reified their status as modern through their attempts to distance themselves from the past, imagined in the form of a rural, unhygienic and undisciplined daily life, and through their strategies for coping with the everyday realities of present day urban life. Among these strategies was the desire for efficiency and health, both contingent on a temporal consciousness that prioritized longevity and created time for leisure and exploration of the city and all that it had to offer. There are many ways to see and to live in a time-conscious age. Within the domestic realm, a modern temporal frame could be detected in objects and gestures. The so-called new style that I described to you was self-consciously modern with its embrace of efficiency and sleekness discussed above. And we learn later in the article can be found in the most mundane of objects, whether dishes, furniture, or quote, the trifles of home life. Even though for most residents of the capitals in the fin de siècle in Russia, the very notion of the acquisition of decorative objects was a, a desire alone, such aspirational sentiments proliferated in the publications meant to reach new urban dwellers of a variety of socioeconomic circumstances. Whether as laborers only dreaming of <clears throat> their efficient new flats, or as professionals purchasing, purchasing gadgets for the kitchen, Russians were surrounded by notions of domestic interiors that reflected contemporary understandings of hygiene, of uniformity, and of modernity itself. As conditions in many arenas became unpredictable, the domestic interior was called upon to serve as a refuge from the storm even as it embodied the many contradictions found in life outside of the front hallway. Now I'm going to just focus on one room of the house as my kind of last big example here. I'm going to focus on the kitchen, okay, which is uh, among the more important rooms in the house discussed in these magazines. The kitchen, or in an urban apartment, whether a small modest space within a tiny apartment or a fully stocked large room or two in a domicile of the well-off, played a central role in the house, in the apartment, and embodied the hopes and the demands of modern times. Women in particular were inundated with instructions on how to manage the kitchen and create an up-to-date environment for themselves and for their families. Sometimes they had hired help, but mostly women were on their own. One 1908 piece included the instructions that, quote, in not bad and modest apartments, always assign a not so big room to the kitchen. In the room, there must be an oven, an ordinary stove made from simple brick and tile. 
The author continues to explain that every once in a while, the stove needs to be cleaned so that you can regulate the flame. And there's a long list of items that each kitchen, however modest, was expected to have. In other words, whether modest or fancy, the kitchen had to meet modern standards, a very stringent kind of requirement to be efficient, hygienic, and ultimately modern. So in the well-stocked kitchen, a number of gadgets, uh, the number of gadgets appears numerous. But even the most modest setups were expected to meet these minimum requirements. This is especially true since the image of the homemaker who cleans and cooks and makes use of her modern gadgetry in the kitchen emerges as a kind of symbol of the now, right, of the present, with seeds of the soon-to-be future, the urban efficient homemaker. Several journals have columns or sections expressly reserved for the homemaker and her kitchen responsibilities. Homemakers, these, col these columns dictate, were required to consult scientific effort experts and to learn about up-to-date domestic technology. Moreover, since one of the key venues for the enactment of middle-class femininity was, of course, the modern kitchen, it's difficult to discuss fin de siècle norms of kitchen decoration and cleanliness without mentioning gender. The stakes in organizing the home in such a way were high, and the power granted to women was significant. The apartment had multiple roles to play in the modern domestic drama. It was simultaneously meant to provide, of course, a cozy refuge from the dirt and the grime of the industrial present and to embrace the present with an eye to the future through the emergence of new scientific principles for the home. The kitchen sat at the center of all of those temporal demands. Efficiency with its attention to flow, to the flow of time and speed of action was paramount in all of these prescriptions. The achievement of the efficient use of time relied on technological advancement and scientific knowledge. The kitchen, the site of food preparation and consumption, required the most mechanization and technological innovation in order to ensure that time was not wasted and that food was properly prepared in a kind of predictable, uniform manner. The kitchen thus required the proliferation of objects, right? Gadgets. Um, how am I doing on my own time? What time do I have until? One? one? Just one? One? Okay. All right, I'm good. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, that's perfect. All right, let me just read from this one example. In a series of linked articles, so there's so many articles about the kitchen, but in one series of linked articles entitled How to Set Up the Modern Kitchen, readers were confronted by this connection, right, of efficiency and temporality. In the modern kitchen, we find dishes, ma dishes made from many metals, copper, nickel, iron, enamel, and clay. Good dishes will have no influence on the flavor of the food. Good dish dishes should not be too heavy and um, should be easily cleaned. A good pan should not influence the color or the taste of the food. Um, and although, to be fair, the past was not discarded entirely, the author remarks that, that certain kinds of dishes harken back to the era of our grandmothers, and therefore, in some instances, are imagined irreplaceable, and should indeed be used, especially for traditional kasha. So the past does not completely recede, but it is very much intermingled with the march toward efficiency, um, health, and longevity. Okay. We will move on to concluding thoughts. The connections among interiors, aesthetics, and temporalities evident in the examples I did and did not read to you um, highlight how fin de siècle Russians' awareness of time, of the present, and of the ever proximate past, whether through um, narratives of nostalgia or the insistence on efficiency. Embracing the present, its expectations, its habits, and its material objects offered an escape hatch from the drudgery of the past, even if in one's imagination alone. Likewise, longing for and recreating a past had an appeal all its own. The past in newly urban Russia loomed especially large in comparison to other European capitals at the same time. Russia's transformation 
happened, as we know, at a breakneck speed. In Moscow and Petersburg, where the majority of urban migrants were peasants or peasant workers in the modern imaginary, the cloak of unmodernity continued to shroud the landscape. Um, and that was, of course, in the form of rural habits, such as uncleanliness, darkness, and chaos, even as Russians moved to cities and aspired to create modern urban lifestyles of their own. Urban, Ru urban Russians, as historian Mark Steinberg points out in his study of Fendisiecla Petersburg, um, were aware that, there were, that they were experiencing large-scale shifts characteristic of modernity that would transform their everyday lives. And the precise nature of these changes, of course, were not always transparent. As Steinberg highlights, for instance, there is no such exact word modernity in the Russian language. Some artists and architects use the word from French modern in Latin letters, but that was rare and the meaning narrow. Rather, the commonly used Russian word, of course, is sovremianist, which properly translated means of the present time. But just as modern began to mean, quote, a particular epochal time in the French context, the word sovremianist in Russia at the fin de siècle began to signify the quote, the distinctive times, and was understood to mean contemporary times or modernity. Ultimately, Savrimianus indicated the particular conditions that were emerging in Russia's capital cities. In the prescriptive tracts available to these urban dwellers, journals, magazines, advertisements, there appeared endless references to in our times, right, or in modern times, reflecting this modern historical consciousness. Russians encountered these prescriptive discourses as they absorbed the new expectations of urban life, norms shaped by modern temporal concerns. So at the same moment, temporal shifts were felt in the particular, in the daily, and in the mundane activities of everyday life, whether through efficiency or cleanliness, or the simple standardization and measuring of minutes in the hour or hours in the day. Modernity was ushering in a new day, a new now, in our times, a time that belonged to us, the urban Russian reader. This hour or us contains a theirs or then, who were likely to be the rural peasants stuck in the old ways of the past. Discursively thus, the past was imagined as dangerous, in part because of its association with Russian rural realities and embodied by the peasant who threatened the creation of a modern urban now. And yet, as I've attempted to show, simultaneous with these ideals emerged a deep sense of nostalgia, which celebrated the past, whether imagined or real, Perhaps we can chalk these contradictory impulses to the very notion of the multiplicity of temporal frameworks embedded in the new notions of historical time at the Russian fin de siècle. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Questions, <laughs> thoughts, please. Sure. That's interesting. So, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I don't know extensively, but it, what comes to mind immediately is that there are a variety of exhibitions. There's one I'm thinking of in particular that was about childhood, and it was a kind of exhibition. I think it was in Moscow. It was in the, I'm not remembering the precise year, but it was in the 1910s, and it was on the hygienic child, and there were images of children's rooms and so forth and how, you know, to put together a room. So there were just domestic spaces for children on display, toys and various material objects associated with this modern idea of childhood. And I'm sure there are other such exhibitions that I will now look at. Good idea. Thank you. Please.
Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder um, you know, what was kind of the idea for, for men in martyrdom. Um, you mentioned your kind of death and you know, what was But I, I'm curious as to. I mean, it's a very fair and good question. The truth is, most of this material comes from, you know, a dozen or so women's magazines, and there are no men. <laughs> I looked. I mean, obviously, I wrote my first book on masculinity. So I was looking for men, and they just are absent. There's no role that they are assigned within this aesthetic in that context. There are plenty of men in the gentry estate and the nostalgia in the first part of my talk, but in that second part, mm -mm. we know they're men, but they're not in these magazines. Jeff. And then so that was great, Thank you. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, get it over with, Jeff. Do it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Do you know this article by, by Jennifer Jenkins? No. I know who Jennifer Jenkins is. She uh, went here. It's a brilliant article. It's, it's called The Spirit in the Furniture. No. And it's, uh, cool. it's really about the, uh, and it's about, you know, obviously, uh, domestic you know, home design mm -hmm. and the objects in the home. And it's really Hamburg before the First World War. Okay. Oh, good. So it's, and it's about the, it's about ki kitchen is also in the time. Okay. So the importance of discrimination, discrimination of taste. Right. And, uh, and pedagogy. Yeah. The citizenship. Yeah. In this kind of cultural sense. Uh, yeah. It's, it's so convergent. Oh, look for it. Thank you. I mean, some of the, just to, uh, pedagogy makes me think of this. The One of the magazines or journals, Woman, has a, a variety of sections. So I in this talk, I'm really just taking from the sections that are about the homemaker. But the one of the other sections is woman as basically pedagogue, if you will. So certainly the women are assigned that role as well. So I will I'll look for, so they're basically assigned worker, pe you know, pedagogue, mother, homemaker, and so forth in these magazines. So thank you. So, so among the interesting things in this article, uh, um, you know, Jennifer's first, first book is on, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the pedagogies of right. modernity and improvement. Uses uh, Lichtfach, a museum. Yeah. Guy. Um, and but what's so interesting is the is the agency which is tied to the furniture. Because yes. That title, the spirit in the, in the furniture, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So it's not so, so. So these are not completely inert objects, but they have exactly the kind. Thank you. You know, I mean, um, the other person who writes about kind of objects and agency, of course, is Auslander, has a whole book, has a really terrific article. I took that part out of the talk, but that's uh, something I'm thinking about very much. Oh, oh, Jennifer was there first? Cheers. Okay, thank you. I think you were next, Jennifer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Please. Mm-hmm. 
That's interesting. Yes. Especially aged wine, to which you add coffee or something like that. And he turns this all into uh, basically uh, just production of domestic uh, <coughs> gadgetry. He turns it into a production of ceramic objects. Oh, wow. Uh, which is uh, kind of that's interesting. <laughs> I'm guessing, I'm guessing men, the same man who is m mocking this and making fun of it takes advantage of the nice cozy refuge that he comes home to every evening. Just have to add that. But thank you. Go ahead. I think you were nice. I just, I just want to follow up actually that when the comparative wine and, and how much of it is not just the clone, but also uh -huh. how much, what is Russian in there? Mm. And in, in the conclusion of the talk, you get to this. So I'm given that this is something that's happening throughout the region, Western Europe, and North America, I'd be curious to see wh what is the Russian, mm -hmm. where is the Russianness? There is, well, work on national identity, so I think there must be, <laughs> but maybe there isn't. But that would be interesting to see where mm -hmm. it is and it is not. And then my second question, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's interesting that Science CX is a, you know, it's an important turning point. But I was wondering if, if since you go to 1930, if you could compare two turning points, mm -hmm, the and the revolution, right, and how the rearrangement of domestic life, yeah. especially with you know after World War One and the revolution, the communal apartments, of course, things like that, how that might be kind of tackled with, or the critique of this bourgeois, you know, basically oh. the magazine you're talking about is town and country, which is in yeah, yeah, yeah. Same Name, that right? that first one, yeah, of yeah. course, yes. So that would be interesting to look at different kinds of turning points. Yes. You know, uh, cultural, temporal versus political that have a different impact on domesticity. And, and so, so okay, I mean, so the second question is easy to answer, which is just invite me back in a year because that part of the book I haven't re written yet. So I'm really, I, I think it will be phenomenally interesting and the questions you raise are precisely the ones I will ask of the material, but I haven't done it yet, so I can't pretend that. Um, and then the first question about what is Russian? I mean, you know, I haven't figured that out entirely, but the argument I'm making at this moment, and it may change, I think has something to do with well, would you accept this argument? Let's put it this way. That it has something to do with the existence of these multiple frames at the same time. So on the one hand, you have this kind of intense nostalgia for a gentry estate, a kind of you know pastoral moment of centuries past. That same moment, it could be the same audience of people reading and thinking about this kind of hyper-efficiency modernity. And what I'm trying to argue is that they both are markers of Russian modernity, that one is not not modern, that ultimately the very existence of the ways in which they are imagining time itself marks the modern moment. Of course, in the efficiency and the ways in which the outside world is described in these magazines, I'm guessing, although I suppose I should get to know some of the European magazines more than I do, uh, but I wonder if the ways in which the urban environment is described is not actually significantly different than it's described in, in other European contexts. I don't know, but that's, you know, I, I would guess that that's true as well. Ron. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, you may not be able to answer this question because you said you haven't done the Soviet Yes. Test, but I would make it, so the question, I'm going to say is a statement. Good. <laughs> what, what you're describing, you know, this efficiency, this looking toward the future, fear of the peasant, all of these things. Yes. Sound like Bolsheviks, right? Yes. And, and what's really interesting is that they all get a musical accompaniment. You do. <laughs> so it, it, but, you know, a lot of things we Bolsheviks yeah. are actually pre-revolutionary yeah. intelligentsia or other elite attitudes 
they're day and doc, you know, in public health and in other aspects. Yes. It seems to me that, that's a good part, big part of your story. Yes. Is that, you know, they don't invent the world over. They think no. they're doing that. That's but right. But they're borrowing from, from their own experiences, you know, when they were younger. The yes. Of the necessity, they do yeah. change. The, yeah, of course, they significantly change, but... The point is that, is that mm -hmm. what's different? You know, how is, how is this, what is well, continuing, and then what's different? I mean, the imagined ideal transforms in significant ways, to, just to the point of what's the same, the whole idea of kind of efficiency of domestic life reminds me very much of what I described in your class yesterday, where I said the Bolsheviks themselves had this kind of timeline of how the day was to go. It's actually fairly similar to these kind of efficient timelines um, that these magazines are advertising. Advocating earlier, so yes, thank you. Please. Yeah. I can't really say what happens in urban apartments per se. Though I mean, I remember reading in graduate school an article about you know the red corner and how the red corner. I'm sure you all have read that article, right? How the red corner was once the place where the icon sat, at least within the peasant environment. I'm not sure what happens. It's a good question with the urban environment. Maybe similar types of things. I would guess. I bet he knows. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. There's nothing that I've come across. Nothing that I've come across. Yeah. Object of value and reverence without maybe all of its religious connotations. Right, and a nostalgia, as as you just said, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's lots. Yes. There are ones for workers, ones for peasants. You know, there, there are multiple, and also ma the ones that are more practically minded, ones that are more ideological. There's a whole slew. Right, so those are the ones I haven't read yet. So, you know, <laughs> they're sitting in my office. Um, but so far, what I can tell from collecting the material is that... Um, the detailed emphasis on domestic space per se is certainly less, you know, that less, that there's a lot more emphasis on the kind of ideological creation of communal domestic space. But the detailed kinds of things that I've described here, I have not yet found in those magazines, but maybe I will. Please. Yeah. So what you're suggesting is the move from what I'm describing here to Germany, as opposed to the Soviet rendition uh, of domestic I space. Yeah. Sure. Yes. 
Interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm thinking as you're talking also about this question of what's Russian. One thing that's probably important to say is that in this is pre-Soviet, but in the the earlier part of the century, Russia actually never had the kinds of um, like interior design type magazines that you find, say, in Germany, France, and elsewhere. So they just were absent. They were, they, I probably should say that, that those kinds of, of publications that were meant kind of expressly for interior design, per se, did not exist. The things I'm reading are the best I could do, <laughs> and, you know, if you know what I mean. So, so I'll look at what you're suggesting. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's great. And so, like, there's, like, also uh, a greater sense of the visual uh, in this. I don't know how the old czars say anything, but there's a lot of, like, this modern... Yeah. Soviet, uh, like no, I mean, if I had had my act together, you would be looking at the... The images, they're especially in that nostalgia one, it, it's beautiful. And the covers are gorgeous, sorry. It's, it's a beautiful magazine. And there are pictures in all of these. Um, they don't quite compare to the glossy, colorful USSR construction, um, which would be fun to use. It's just too late for my book, unfortunately, because there's a lot in there about domesticity and so forth. All right, other questions, thoughts? All right, then thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers.